Welcome back into the Line I Cast. It's your host, Austin Berkland, and we are going to talk some Nebraska Cornhuskers football with the Sully Scoop Boys, part of the Big Banter Podcast Network. Guys, how are you guys doing? Good. How are you today, Austin? Yeah, doing great. Uh, Thanks for having us on. Not a problem. A pair of two and three teams going at it. And let's just get your initial thoughts on this game. Let's start with you, Beasel. Uh, yeah, I personally, I feel like this is a get right game for both teams. I think both teams came in with higher expectations uh, than what they've been able to produce so far into the season. You know, both teams being two and three, both teams only winning against non power five teams. This is really that opportunity for either team to hit the ground running and take on a and get a win against a power five team. And Jay Sol, how about you? What's your initial thoughts? Well, you know, the saying is misery loves company. Unfortunately, in this game, one of the teams is going to have to come out with a win. I'm not really sure that either team at this point really deserves to have a win against a power five team. However, you know, it's going to be a super sloppy game. And at the end of the game, you know, they're going to they're going to crown a champ of this game. But do they really deserve it? It's going to be another tale. I mean, there's going to be a lot of penalties and a lot of turnovers. I think this is going to be a terrible game to watch. Jay, so what are your initial impressions of what Matt Rule has done in his first year as Cornhusker head coach? Now, Matt Rule, so to speak, I am liking the, you know, the recruiting, the transfers he's brought in. Unfortunately, we lost a five star in Eric Gilbert. Who knows what's happening? He's hitting some vape somewhere. That's about all we know. Um, but, you know, he's got this team. He's doing what a Matt Rule team would do. I mean, two and three. Matt Rule, when he starts somewhere, it is bad. However, you're losing games that you, could have potentially won it, it's coming down to turnovers to where i'm not really b- blaming matt rule at the beginning here i'm blaming our offensive coordinator satterfield who was dropping back a quarterback throwing like it's tom brady out there and really we have seen interception after interception whether it's jeff throws a pick sims or heinrich harberg who should be running the ball you just got to get behind the offensive line run the ball run the clock and just get get out of the game with either a close game or a win. At that point, I will be happy. I don't like watching the blowouts like we have seen, and I don't like watching no adjustments. So I guess that is where I'm starting to blame Matt Rule, is he is not really taking charge. I mean, we go into half against Michigan. Sorry, I'm getting on a ramble here. You got me fired up. Oh, you're all good. Matt Rule. But (laughs) we go into half against Michigan. It is 28 to 0. I mean, it was... The game is over. This is Michigan. This is the top dog in the Big Ten right now. You're not coming back. I want to see changes. Put some other guys out there. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. And we only scored seven points at the end of the game on a lucky run from a wide receiver who is now working at running back. Why this was the first run we saw of the day from him, I have no idea when he was off to the races and DBs weren't able to keep up with him. Beasel, what have been some of your positives uh, from this Nebraska season so far? I know it's difficult at two and three. I, I've had my own issues with Illinois uh, being two and three, but what are some of your positives, I guess, for this Husker team so far? Yeah, I Jason is going to get me on get on me here because my it's a short list. <laughs> my my biggest positive this year is after you know, the last eight years with Mike Riley and Scott Frost, you came out and they ran a scripted offense and a scripted game plan the entire game. There were no adjustments at any point during the game. They stuck in, they dug their heels in the ground, they kept going. Matt Rule goes into halftime and makes adjustments. And I know against Michigan, Jaisal, we came out, we didn't see any other like new guys get out there. It was really more trying to get guys snaps and try to get them to understand the offense more. And I think that's what was going on there. But they go into halftime and they're not afraid to make adjustments. I mean, you saw against uh, Colorado, for example, you win it at half, you're down, or you're down basically on self-inflicted wounds, and you come out and the first drive out of the gate, it's running the ball and it's trying to establish you are the most, most uh, the more physical team. You did the same thing against, uh, I believe it was Louisiana Tech, where at halftime it was a close game, probably shouldn't have been. And the first drive out of half, you come out, you run the ball 14 times and you put points on the board that he's not afraid to say, Hey, slow it down. We're more physical. We need to run the ball. We need to establish the run and we need to stick with it. 
Bissell, uh, you look at what the expectations have been for Nebraska in the past, and has there been a redefining of expectations like for Matt Rule in the like the short term? I say short term, like one to three years. See, I would say there's not a re a reclassification of expectations in Nebraska. This is the team. This is the state lives and dies with it. You know, on a Saturday afternoon, if the team loses an 11 a.m. game, there is nothing going on. Everybody shuts down statewide. Everybody's 100% living and dying with them. Expectations are still there. The expectation going into every season is a conference championship. National championship on top of that, but you got to win a conference championship. And it has been so long since we've even been in a conference championship that you can feel the pain and the angst in the stadium that with any loss or anything, just everybody is grasping at straws trying to figure out what is going on, what is wrong. And so, and I, I think the hardest part too is Matt Rule came in and took over, you know, the offseason national champs. That's that's what we are every year. We win the offseason every year. So for Matt Rule to come in and everybody's like, well, you got to give him time. Well, it's hard to give him time when when everybody's riding a high on the offseason championship that you're like, come on, we, we got this. We're going to, we're going to lock it down. And we're going to win. Basil, how has Matt rule done recruiting wise uh, for the long term of the program? And has he attacked the transfer portal pretty well? Well, I honestly got to say that I really like his recruiting. And one thing that Scott Frost didn't do, you have Dylan Rayola, the number one guy. He is blowing off Dylan Rayola. As soon as Matt Rule got here, Dylan Rayola's uncle, Donovan Rayola, is the offensive line coach for the Huskers. Why this guy isn't being recruited? His dad played for Nebraska. He is a legacy guy. Why are we not recruiting him? And that is one thing that Matt Rule came in and did right away. And honestly, this is a guy in Dylan Rayola who the Huskers stood no – they shouldn't have been in contention, I will say, to get him. And all of a sudden, we're competing with Georgia for him. And – Honestly, you know, something's going to happen in a year. I mean, a lot of guys want to go in and play their freshman year. So hopefully he sees that he has a great opportunity to play at Nebraska. So he might might want to change his mind. However, in the transfer portal then, I mean, Matt Rule, is, he's going after athletes and guys that have experience and stuff. Yes, Jeff Sims isn't the best guy to bring in. However, Jeff Sims was highly recruited by Matt Rule when Matt Rule was at Baylor. And Matt Rule has also been picking up guys from – Georgia, who, I mean, Eric Gilbert, yeah, we don't have to go down that that train, but other guys on the defense ha that he brought in are really stepping up. Omar Brown is a safety. This guy is flying around the field. He's getting hits. He has an interception this year, which is one of our lonely interceptions. And this team is starting to band together with the older guys and more experience, especially with like a Billy Kemp getting Billy Kemp, the ball. He's a slot receiver who is fast came from Virginia. However, getting in the ball is seeming to be difficult, but in a jet sweep, they get him into the game involved. And it is showing that guys like that, that transfer in with experience are big for this team. And honestly, one of our best offensive linemen at this point is our center, Ben Scott, who I was giving B so hard time for, complimenting this guy coming in as he is coming from Arizona state who also lost their head coach. So I don't know why B saw was so high on a guy who was coming in after he just lost his own head coach, but this guy has been proven that he is our, one of our top offensive line. I mean, if that's a compliment, I have no idea, but he is one of the best ones for the Huskers out there. So are Nebraska fans happy that they joined the big 10 or would they rather be somewhere else at this point? Um, you know, that one, that one's an interesting one. I think, I think for the most part, Nebraska fans are happy to be part of the big 10. I think it was a bigger learning curve than anybody initially expected. Um, especially the last two seasons in the big 12, you were competing in a big 12, uh, big 12 championship. You didn't win either of them, but you were there. You come to the big 10 and again, it, it's a learning curve. The defense is built to stop the spread offense in the Big 12 versus when you come to the Big 10, everybody plays inside the tackles. <laughs> so inside the hash mark the entire game. So that part has been a learning curve in readjusting the offense and defense side of it. But I think for the most part, everybody's pretty happy about being in the Big 10. The only part would be 
losing some of those, you know, historic rivalries that you built over the years back to the big eight days. And so it's nice to see some of those um, getting to be played again in like the non-conference games that instead of scheduling, granted, I'd rather play an FCS school to get right, but it's nice to get some of those rivalry games reestablished and, you know, just kind of get some of that nostalgia going. Yeah. What was that like uh, playing Colorado again, Jaisal? Well, it was a great experience. Unfortunately, you know, with Dion going there, the ESPN is all over them and I cannot get it. I cannot get my enough of my fill. You know, it's Dion this, Dion that. Listen, that team just got blown out by Colorado and they got beat by USC. They're not that good. However, everyone is still rolling with them. I think it was a great opportunity for the Huskers to go in there. However, it shows how much Dion really did improve that program as they were a one in 11 squad last year. But I liked the opportunity because it was like a rivalry game that was getting to the roots. The kids knew it mattered because the fans showed how much it mattered. I mean, tickets were the most expensive for a college football game this season. The, the cheapest you could get was a $400 ticket in the nosebleeds at a Colorado game, a one in 11 squad versus a four and eight squad. That is unheard of. And I think it really shows how big some of those big eight rivalries are. Jason, who are some of the X factors uh, on defense for this Nebraska team that Illinois fans should keep an eye on? It's going to be right up front. We're talking Nash. Hut Matcher. Hut Matcher is a stud. He he was a state qualifying, or sorry, a state champ in wrestling in Nebraska. He is a big dude. He knows how to use his hands and get to the backfield. Ty Robinson is another one that he is going to be quick in there. And having Hut Matcher there with Robinson honestly opens up his playing ability. Last year he was not as special. Tiso would call him one star Ty and. If Hutmacher wasn't out there, you would see why. But then another guy is a freshman. Um, I'm blanking right now. He's he is my guy. He was my pick to be the, the guy this year. Yeah, Lenhart. He sat out last week, unfortunately, with an injury. But I'm pretty sure he's going to be back this week. But Cameron Lenhart is a true freshman coming from IMG Academy, which – he is a big dude. He does not look like a freshman. So I think it's going to be the upfront guys, but running the 3 3 5 is different for the Big Ten play. But I like it because you can throw in different schemes and back off guys at a certain point. But a big playmaker in our deep or in our DBs is going to be Gifford. He flies over the field and he's one of the only guys that really knows how to tackle well. Let's talk receivers, B Soul, who is helping. Uh, this Nebraska passing game and who's hurting it? Oh man. Um, who's hurting it is probably, you know, I'm going to take a cheap shot here. It's probably the quarterback play. Um, you know, they, the wide receivers aside from not being able to necessarily get open, we don't have anybody with, you know, breakaway speed to where those 50, 50 balls are 50, 50 because everybody's draped all over everybody. Um, top two wide receivers to watch for in this game are going to be Marcus Washington. Um, I mean, last week, I believe he had a 57 yard catch, but then you didn't see from him again. Um, you know, I think he had one play where he was overthrown, uh, and one catch, maybe two targets all game. Uh, you've got Billy Kemp who they try to run through the slot and they try to get him involved, but Billy Kemp, for whatever reason is not getting open. There's always a safety draped all over him. So that's what JSL was talking. They're trying to do, you know, the end around, which I think is the dumbest play in all of football. At a certain point, if you're going to run the ball, run the ball with your running backs. Stop bringing a wide receiver from the edge to try and catch the edge when corners are just following them right across the field. Looking ahead to this Nebraska schedule, how confident are you in any of the games that you guys have remaining? You have Illinois, you have Northwestern, Purdue, Michigan State, Maryland, Wisconsin, and Iowa left. So I guess I'm guessing where what I guess I'm asking is where's your place in the Big Ten West, Jason? Where would you say your place is in the Big Ten West, Jason? Oh, sorry. 
my connection's about as good as, you know, the Huskers season so far. So it, it was a little laggy there. But how do I feel that we're going to be going this year with the rest of the games? I mean, not well. I think, you know, it was a good opportunity starting the year. I was living a high after the Minnesota game. We competed with Minnesota, who I thought was going to be one of the top dogs in the West this year. And, you know, we competed with them. So my hopes were high. Then, you know, we play a team with athletes in Colorado get beat unfortunately we got blown out towards the end but we get beat and uh, it still goes down as a loss and it was a pretty big loss and then you know you beat teams you should beat in fcs or fbs you know non-power five schools and then you get beat by michigan i am not looking forward to the rest of the year i mean these are all west teams that you know in the big 10 west are all about the same caliber and you're going to lose the teams you shouldn't you might beat a team you shouldn't however i mean Maryland, they're one of the they're undefeated right now. I don't want to play Maryland. I don't want to play Wisconsin. Wisconsin, I mean, has been handling people and they're running a whole different scheme. I don't know if we're going to be able to keep up with our offense. And Iowa's defense is always scary. I mean, I don't know. We might fall into two more wins this entire year. Do you think Iowa will score 25 points against you guys? (laughs) <laughs> no, and especially with Cade McNamara going down for the year. Yes, that is one great thing about being in the Big Ten West is having Brian Ferentz uh, on every opponent's sideline. Um, that is just amazing to have. Um, but absolutely, Beasel... Give, make sure you keep your uh, make sure you keep your step stool. By the way, not sure if you saw that video. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Beasel looking. Looking ahead to this Nebraska program in terms of uh, against a team like Northwestern, even um, where do you think this team is men- mentally um, going into this game and Northwestern? Ooh, that's a that's a good one because I think I think mentally, I think the coaching staff has prepped these kids that it's going to be a learning curve this year. Um, I don't think they prepped the fan base well enough that it's going to be a learning curve, but I think he's been prepping the uh, prepping the kids all all off season. Like, hey, trust the system, trust the process. You know, we're we're going to we're going to build something here, and it just it takes you know one two wins against a power five teams that really could snowball into something here that you get the kids believing in it. Um, in terms of where I think the player mentality is, I think it's probably, you know, not as high as I'd like it to be. I'd like the team to be like, hey, listen, you know, we played decent against Minnesota. We hung with Colorado for a half of football. We, you know, for Michigan, we shot ourselves in the foot in the first quarter and then had to get out of our gameplay. But when you look at everybody who's on this team, and I I mean this in the most non-negative way, all of these guys who have stuck around, who are seniors, who are juniors, they have never been part of a winning football program at Nebraska. That Scott Frost did not win more than three games. So for all we know, these kids are, you know, not going to sleep upset about it. I think the fire in the competitors that we have, I think they are upset about it. Um, I know after this Michigan game, uh, they were out in full pads on Sunday for practice. Um, you know, there were a couple of reports that they interviewed Ben Scott, our starting center, and he said he had never had to be in full pads the day after a game. And he said the team needed it and they needed a full practice to kind of get their heads right. So in theory, um, the kids are still checked in. They're not checked out yet. So that should be a good sign there. But I, it remains to be seen if we lose to Illinois and we lose to Northwestern, um, I think it'll tell a lot about the morale of the program and tell you that a lot of these kids still have the same mentality that they had under Scott Frost, that I'm just here for a good time, not necessarily here to win football games. All right, guys, it is time for predictions. Uh, Beasel, what is your prediction for this game? Yeah, I think, um, I think fortunately for Nebraska, I think this Illinois game falls at a good point in the schedule. It really starts for what I would consider winnable games for Nebraska in a row here. Um, It just comes down to, can they get the job done? And I think with Illinois struggling um, to really have an identity as well, I think it'll be a sloppy game, but I think Nebraska has got a good shot and I've got them winning 21 to 17. 
Jaisal, what is your prediction? Well, I'm taking it. All the Illini fans, they're going to be, you know, happy to hear this one, especially Chief if he's out there listening. I got this being a sloppy game and the fighting Illini taking down the Huskers 24 to 10. Jaisal, where can people find the Sully Scoop podcast? Yeah, you can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts, whether that's uh, YouTube, Apple, Spotify. Um, we also are very active on Twitter. We are uh, at Sully underscore Scoop. Um, you can look for us there. And anytime, if you're on Twitter, we tweet out the links anytime there is any new content posted by the Scoop. Thank you guys for joining the show and uh, best of luck on Saturday. Best of luck to the Illini this week. Yep, best of luck. Thanks for having us. All right. See you guys.